Well, we're going to start looking at 2 Timothy, and we're going to break bread after we've had a think about 2 Timothy chapter 1. This is Paul's last letter, really, before he dies, and I think he comes to a lot of spiritual maturity right at the end of his life. A wonderful letter. Let's start with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you because we have committed our lives to you and to your Son, we committed them despite our weakness and our humanity. But we have done so, and we love your Son. We have come to focus upon him and all the things that are in him and the whole message that you have to us, that you've given us in your word and your desire to save us. Father, we have come to focus upon that. And we thank you for this bread and wine that makes it come real again, that finally we have something visual to focus upon. Please help us, Father. And we pray, Father, that you truly will help us, that the spirit of Paul and the spirit that you wish to put in Timothy might be in us. Please go with us, Father. Guide us in our thinking. Be with us in all our ways. Direct our paths towards your kingdom, that in all things we might glorify you. Heavenly Father, we plead your promise that there will no test or temptation come upon us that is too great for us to bear but that you will, with that test and temptation, make a way to escape that we might be able to bear it. And we pray, Father, for those who are being tested apparently to the uttermost, for those who are being persecuted, for those who are desperately poor, for those who face crises in their lives, for those facing death itself, for those facing apparently dead-end situations in life. We pray, Father, that you will be with each and every one of us and open our eyes to the simple reality of your love and of your passion toward us. And we pray, Father, that we might feel again the comfort of your love, the knowledge again of your grace. For Jesus' sake. Amen. So, uh, as I said, this is Paul in a sense, in a human sense, at his most mature, that he's come to the end of his life, the end of his race, in chapter 4 here, he's going to be saying, look, Timothy, you know, this is it. Uh, I'm at the end now. I've run the race. This is a finish. So here you see someone who, although, sure, what he writes is inspired by God, all the same. That is that, I think, human element in the whole inspiration process, whereby Paul is a dying man, writing his dying thoughts. So he says that he is an apostle of Jesus, verse 1, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. Now that promise of life is not simply the promise of eternal life, but the promise of the life which is now. Godliness, as he's written to, to Timothy, affects both our lives now and gives hope of the eternal life. That's why in John's Gospel you read the Lord teaching that you can have eternal life now, right now, in the sense that you can start living the kind of life now which you are going to eternally live. Now, in that case, then, you know, we, that of itself is cause for self-examination. What sort of life am I living now? Is this what I shall eternally like doing? You know, if our life is focused around spiritual things, well, sure, that is what you're going to be doing forever and ever. But if your life, frankly, is focused on the same things that this world is focused upon, well, no, that's not living the eternal life, is it? Because that stuff is not going to go on. The stuff of career, wealth creation, enjoyment of the flesh, all this sort of thing. This is not going to be the eternal life. So live the eternal life now. And then he says to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. Now, many times he, he uses this idea of having children. That he addresses the people whom he's baptized or those that he's worked for in a pastoral sense as his children. And particularly about Timothy. But Timothy was not one of Paul's converts. Timothy had been converted apart from Paul, and he alludes to that here when he talks about the faith which was first in your grandmother Lois and then in your mother Eunice. But he still calls Timothy his son in the faith. Why? Because he'd obviously put a huge amount of spiritual input into Timothy. And here he is at the end of his life, forsaken, he says, all those in Asia, verse 15, have turned away from me. And he's going to later say, please try and come to me. Just be with me on my, in my time of dying. I just so want to see you because you're my son. 
you see there, almost pathetically really, a man who'd done so much. He was left isolated at the end. The church in Rome, it appears, as he said, as he's going to say in chapter 4, no man stood with me at my trial. He'd been isolated for whatever reason. They didn't want to be associated with him or whatever. He says, Timothy, you're my son. You come to me, please. So, what do you see there is that your relationships in Christ, these are the ones that will last. Even the finest of all human relationships between partners, between husband and wife, between children and parents, grandparents and grandchildren, all these relationships are time limited. And we know that. The inevitable must happen and one party to the relationship must die. And okay, we who are left say, ah, but my mother shall always live on in my heart. Yes, indeed, until you die. And in a secular sense, and that's the end of it. And this is a tragic beyond words. You know, no amount of fine writing and singing and artistry, and playwright, uh, playwrights getting to grips of these things, none of them can even touch on the real awful tragedy of this. But our relationships in the Lord Jesus are different. He had put his energy into Timothy as his beloved son. And he looked forward to spending eternity with him. These are the relationships that will last. And I'm not at all deprecating relationship with your unbelieving family members, not at all. But I'm saying that, beyond all that, there is this connection with each other with you and me, who have sold our souls for the sake of Jesus, with all our weakness, but we have, who are totally sure by his grace that we shall live forever together when Jesus comes back. That is an altogether higher part of human relationship, a totally different kind of relationship to any kind of secular relationship. And they are the relationships that will last and last forever. Uh, sure, we shall weep when you and I die and we hear of each other's passing or we maybe literally bury each other. Okay, sure, but beyond that, there is this knowledge that we shall meet again and all that we went through in this life that bound us together, we shall go on eternally. Now, this is the real unique nature of true Christian fellowship. It's why it's such a huge sin, nothing less than that, to break it up when we stand related to these things. Well, he then says, verse 3, I thank God and I serve with pure conscience that I remember you in my prayers night and day. So this is what happens then in such a relationship, a close relationship with another believer. You will pray for each other all the time. You are in each other's hearts. This is Christian fellowship at its peak. And he says just in passing almost, but he says, I'm telling you the truth here, and I have served God with good conscience, always. And I would like to just pick that up a bit, because he says the same when he's on trial for his life. He says a couple of times, I've served God in good conscience, all my life. And how do you square this with how when he's on the Damascus Road, the Lord Jesus appears to him and says, Paul, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the prods, the cattle prods. And he's saying, look, Saul, you have been persecuting me. You've persecuted and tortured and murdered Christians. Okay, and I have been prodding your conscience and you are running off to Damascus to do the same. Prod, 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 Paul, D Saul, don't do it. So he had been going against his conscience. Jesus says that, but he in his later life says, oh, I've lived in good conscience all the time. How do you square that? <clears throat> well, you, you could argue that, well, as time goes on, we rewrite our own narratives, as possibly King David did. You know, he sinned with Bathsheba, but then when he's paying the price for that, when he's persecuted by Absalom, he starts writing these psalms about, oh, poor me, I'm, I'm the innocent man suffering at the hands of evil people. Well, no, not in terms of what Nathan told him. Uh, it is not quite the case. And we all have that tendency, you see it more clearly in other people, but it is in every one of us, isn't it? To look back on failures of the past and to rewrite the narrative. Yeah, well, actually, I was okay. It was, yeah, I, I felt bad about it at the time, but actually it was her fault. It was his fault. It was their fault. 
What happened really was this. So it could have been that. But I think in Paul's case not. Because when he talks about having lived in good conscience before God, when he's on trial, okay, um, before or various people he was on, on trial before, he also in the same speech where he says, I have lived in good conscience before God all my life, he, he goes and talks about his former life. And he admits that he did terrible things and that Jesus appeared to him and said, it's hard for you to kick against the, the prods. So, how do you understand it? I think Hebrews, which I personally think Hebrew, uh, Paul wrote, I think Hebrews helps us there when it says that in Christ, the conscience is cleansed. And it's hard to put meaning into those words. What does it mean that my conscience is cleansed in Christ? Well, I think one of the ideas is that we are so forgiven, if you believe it, that you are actually made free from sin. In the sense that there, as he says, there remains now no conscience of sin, no consciousness, if you like, or conscience. That the bad conscience is washed, is cleansed, to the point that with humility, you can say that although I am a sinner, I am absolutely fine in my conscience. And not only now, but actually my whole life has been washed. My whole life has been cleansed. That's a, a huge dimension to forgiveness. And we struggle, I think, to accept that. Because in human forgiveness, you don't get that. If you sin against me and I say, look, it's okay. You stole 20 quid out of my, I don't know, my jeans pocket. I forgive you. Honestly, forgive you. Go your way. All good. Well, that's me to you. Right. Does that cleanse your conscience? No, it doesn't. Whereas God's forgiveness has this deeper dimension, that it is not simply, okay, I scribble that, play on. There's something more, that he can cleanse your very conscience, the consciousness or conscience of that sin. Now that is what he can do, and man's forgiveness cannot do that. This is the wonder of, of the things that we, we remember. When you take the the cup, and remember that this is the symbol of his blood and his cleansing of me. It's not just scribbling off sin and saying, okay, Johnny, play on. It is more than that. It is the cleansing of conscience to the point that we can be like Paul and say, look, I've lived in good conscience before God. And, and yet in the same breath, admit that I've walked against the prods of conscience in the past. So again, he's saying this at the very end of his life. He can say to Timothy, Look, I serve God with pure conscience. And I'm telling you that, and I always have done, so I'm telling you the truth when I say I pray for you day and night. And he says, verse 4, Greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears. And mindful means just that. My mind is full of your tears. So this is the way to live. Not being self-centered. I mean, you're sitting in a in a prison cell, as he was, pretty well awaiting his death, I guess the natural human response is to be uh, mindful of yourself. But no, he is mindful of others. And this, of course, is the spirit of Jesus who we remember on the cross, that when you, you think of, uh, of the gift of his body, of his sacrifice there, you think, well, how did he do it? Well, I think if he was only concerned about his own salvation, I doubt he would have had the motivation to endure the cross. But he did it for the joy that was set before him. And what was that joy? Well, the psalm says, Psalm 16, At your right hand there are pleasures, there is joy forevermore. And what's he doing at God's right hand? Interceding for us, bringing us to salvation. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That is the repeated emphasis of the scriptures, that he did this for us. And it was that which motivated him, just as in, in human life. It is your motivation, for example, for your family or for others that will motivate you way beyond just being motivated for yourself. And so this is why we have the concept of church, of other brothers and sisters, the body of Christ, other people. It is not a case of just sitting alone in your apartment behind a screen believing the right thing, being, having been baptized, breaking bread occasionally, and all's good. 
there is this wider dimension. I'm not saying you have to physically go to a physical church, to a physical building. But the body of Christ is people, right? It's not a bricks and mortar. You need that connection with them. You definitely need that connection with them. Because we need that higher motivation, which you will only get from this serving of, of others. So, he says, I want you to stir up the gift of God which is in you by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. So, clearly, Timothy had been given the gift of the spirit, but was not using it as he should. The other thing you see is that this gift of the spirit is not talking about miracles. It's not talking about speaking in foreign languages. It's not talking about miracles are raising the dead and so forth. No. The gift of the Holy Spirit, which is available today, is the gift of another mind. The Spirit is basically the mind. A Holy Spirit. A Spirit of holiness, if you prefer. And God will give that to you, and has given it to you, but you've got to stir yourself up, as he says, and make use of it. And by making use of it, he's saying to Timothy, you can have a spirit, a mentality of power, positive, effective, proactive, of love, and of a sound, disciplined mind. So, that is the gift that is promised to us. You start reading Corinthians, and Paul says, oh, God's given you the spirit in abundance. But you come to 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1, and he says, but I can't write unto you as unto spiritual people, because you're not spiritual, you're carnal. So you see, you can be given the Spirit, but not use it. What this is saying then is that there is a huge potential that has been given to us that we can use. Let me just remind you of the how major is this theme that we have been given the gift of the Spirit. Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God, I'll read here about how the Spirit can give you love, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. The arena of operation of the Holy Spirit in our context is the human heart or the human mind. It is a gift of spirit, of mind. Going on, 2 Corinthians 1. God has sealed us and given us the down payment of the Spirit in our hearts. He has sealed us later on in 2 Corinthians, and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. You've got Ephesians 3, where he prays for the Ephesians, that God would strengthen you with might, with power, by his Spirit in the inner man. Inner man, the mind, the heart, however you want to look at it. The Spirit then strengthens the inner man, the essential personality, the mindset, the psychology, however you wish to put it. And Galatians 4 is very clear. Because we are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, our minds, whereby we cry, Abba, Daddy, Father. So, that's just some of the, of the passages we could quote. This is a major theme that cannot be ignored, and it cannot be scribbled by saying, oh, that was in the first century. They had the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. We don't have them today. I agree. We don't have the miraculous spirit gifts. I'm definitely not a Pentecostal. But, but these verses I've quoted are clearly not talking about that, and no amount of levering them around will, will change them. They, they could not actually be clearer, really that this gift of God is a new mindset, a new psychology, but it's not automatic. You don't get baptized and then get zapped, just like that. That suddenly, oh, I'm totally thinking differently and shall do for the rest of my life. You've got to use it, because God does not treat us as puppets. Okay, so that's why he says to Timothy, I gave you that spirit, but you're timid, aren't you? You're nervous. He was timid, Timothy. I mean, he, he was. Uh, and he said, no, don't be like that. Don't be fearful. Don't be looking at all the potential problems and the glass half empty and all that sort of thing. God has not given you that spirit. You have been given the spirit of power, of proaction, of love, and of a sound mind. Now, be like that. Stir yourself up. 
And that's, of course, the message that comes to us. And how was that gift given? Well, it was given specifically through the death of Jesus, which we're here to, to remember. Because we're told in John's record that the Holy Spirit was not yet given because the Lord had not been glorified. When he died, there came out blood and water. Clearly, I think, representing the, the gift of his blood, his spirit to, to us, which you know, we're here to, to remember. But you've got to want to accept this. It's not just a case of drinking a sip of, of wine from this cup. It is a case of saying, God, Jesus, please, I mean, I don't mean Jesus is God, but you know what I'm saying. You can ask both of them, fill me with your spirit. Change me, stir me up, I'm open. You've given it to me, you've given me the potential. Help me to use it. So, <clears throat> Paul says some wonderful words then in 12. I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed. He's using know, as he very often, invariably does, in the Hebraic sense of knowing someone in the sense of having a relationship with them. He's at the end of the race, facing death, and he says, I know whom I have believed. The subtle but crucial difference between I know what I have believed and I know whom I have believed. There's a difference. You can know all sorts of things about, about Jesus, about God, about the kingdom of God. But do you know him? Yeah, this is the whole twist of the Lord's parable when he says the foolish virgins will bang at the door, say, let us in, let us in. And he say, no, who are you? I never knew you. He means... You never had a relationship with me. You never knew me, and because you didn't know me, I didn't know you. We don't know each other. Doesn't mean I don't know your name, I don't recognize your face. The idea is, but we have no relationship. So that's how you want to be uh, all your life, but particularly at the end of your life when you're facing the end. I know whom I have believed, not what I have believed, but whom I have believed. And I don't think that is a peccadillo. I remember taking a sister here in Latvia, for a serious heart operation that she had fairly low chance of getting through. She did actually get through it. Um, and we got to the hospital early, parked up, and uh, she said, well, before we go in, let me just uh, tell you what I believe, make sure have I got it all right. And she came out with a great statement of faith. And she was, she was good on a doctrine. And I thought of this verse. It's not simply, I know what I have believed. I can recite some sort of statement of faith, some doctrinal set of positions. Because that alone won't save you. Because you're saved by a person. And that's Jesus. And he says, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So that day, that's his perspective. He's dying, but that day. And he recognizes, I have committed I've given things to him, and he will keep them. Now, there is no conscious survival of death. Death is unconsciousness. But, of course, God is outside time as we know it. And it is true that who we are, and how we have been, and the decisions we have made, are kept by God. They are kept by him. We have committed things to him. If you had the chance of that apparently high-paying job, that would have involved you being involved in unethical, immoral, maybe, uh, practices, and it was far away from your family, far away from your brothers and sisters, and you said, no, I won't take that. I'll stay doing my dumb, dead-end, minimum wage job. You committed something to Jesus, and he will keep that until that day. And he's got it there in heaven. As I say, it's not forgotten. It is there. Absolutely there. In this sense, in Revelation, you, you read about the blood of those who have been martyred, crying out to God, saying, how long until you avenge us? Well, they're dead, right? But they committed their lives, their blood, to God and to Jesus, and the message of their lives is remembered and is, as it were, crying out in heaven. Although they themselves are totally unconscious and back in the dust. So, he says... We have committed, and what we have committed to him, we shall receive. That is not to say that salvation is by works. 
But remember at the end of Revelation, there are two books open. One is the book of life. You're either in there or not. You are saved by grace. It's the penny a day in the parable. No matter how hard you worked, you still all get a penny. Salvation. But there's another book that's opened, and the dead are judged according to what's written in that book. And they receive every man according as his works shall be. So salvation itself is on the basis of by faith through grace. I mean, there's no doubt about that. It is not of works. But works are still judged in the sense that how you have lived now has forged, if you like, the kind of eternity, the kind of person that you shall eternally be. And so Paul can say that I know and I'm persuaded that what I've committed to him, my life, my health, my career as a, a Pharisee, as a, a rabbi, or whatever, the life I could have had, the business life I could have had, the family life I could have had in his case, I committed that to Jesus, and he knows that, and he will remember that. Likewise, he laments here that um, you know, he's not being visited very much in prison, but he says, um, Onesiphorus, when he was in Rome, he sought me out diligently and found me, and the Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. I think what he's saying is that as this Onesiphorus had shown grace to Paul, who was seen as a, you know, stone-cold loser, and the church in Rome didn't seem to want to know him, no one stood with him at his last trial, etc., as he says in chapter 4. Well, Onesiphorus was different. He sought him out and visited him at a time when to show solidarity with a prisoner like Paul, it seems at that time, was risking his own life. And Paul says, he will find mercy of the Lord in that day. Same phrase as when he said, I know what I've committed to the Lord is committed until that day. And he says it's the same with Onesiphorus, that he will get some kind of, I say reward, there will be some impact on the nature of his eternity, the fact that he did what he did for Paul. Now, as I say, it's not a case of reward for works. That, that would be a mistaken, I think, view. It's more a thing of how he writes the Philippians, that when you're in the kingdom of God, you will be my joy and crown of rejoicing. Well, yes. You'll get all that joy and crown if you've made an effort for other people. And if the people you made an effort for are there living eternally, well, that will be your joy and crown. You're going to eternally be rejoicing that you managed to save and scrape enough money to buy a second home, a holiday home, yeah, that will all be gone. That will be neither here nor there. But what you did for other people, when you see them, maybe someone you preached to, someone you baptised, somebody, maybe like Timothy, you didn't baptise, but you really tried for them. You see them in the kingdom, wow. You're rejoicing. So, <clears throat> verse 15, as I said, all those who are in Asia have turned away from me. I would just like to focus on that a little bit. They turned away from me, Paul says, not from Jesus, but from me. Because when you come to the letters to the churches in the book of Revelation, the seven letters to seven churches, it is quite clear that at least one of those churches was pretty well okay. And even within the others, there were those whom Jesus says have not defiled their garments and they will walk with me in white because they're now walking with me. So in all those churches, there were some who were faithful, and there was at least one of them who was pretty well okay, Jesus seems to be saying. So it's not true that there were no Christians in Asia, but he says, all of them in Asia have turned away from me. Yes, I suggest the stress is on me. That means that all those believers, I don't know, they believe gossip, or they, whatever the situation was, they turned away from Paul. Yes, he might have uh, spread the gospel to us, but he's a terrible guy. Now he's left the faith. Now he's this, that, and the other. Okay. But that doesn't mean that they turned away from Jesus. And I think that helps us in one of the hardest things which there is, I think, in the Christian walk, and that is dealing with all the bitterness, the division, the disillusion, the angst, the tension in relationship between believers. 
the fact that you and me are not actually accepted by all other believers. And it's really hard. You tend to think, well, if they don't accept me, then are they even believers? That's how they treat us. And blah, blah, blah. You've got to learn from this that, yeah, all right, they're not right in the position. You and me are not right either in a lot of our attitudes and positions and so on. But that's not to say that they have turned away from Jesus. So we come then to Jesus, to the bread and wine. And he has got to be our focus. And if he is our focus, then disillusion with others, hurt from others, somehow hurts the less. Because we are secure in our relationship with him. And whether we are accepted by others, by our own brethren, by our own families or not, is no longer the essential issue. And as I say, the wonderful thing is that we can be cleansed through him of all our sin, of all conscience even, of sin historically, even though you remember it as Paul did, but it is dealt with. And Paul here is a wonderful pattern to us of facing the future. Death itself, which is the inevitable for all of us unless Jesus comes, calmly and with courage, because we know whom we have believed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your dear Son, whom we have believed and whom we know, but with whom we seek to deepen our relationship. Father, we thank you for this bread that represents him to us. And we do pray, Father, that we might more fully assimilate him into our innermost beings for his sake. Heavenly Father, we again come to you to thank you for the promise of life which there is in Jesus because of his life, because of his blood. We pray again that we might believe truly in your total forgiveness and cleansing of us to the point that we are, clean, and we are cleansed from conscience of sin and are left to rejoice in hope of your glory and to face whatever lies ahead with peace, because we know whom we have believed. For his sake.